Hi, I'm Richard Finn from the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA and welcome to our ESMO 2017 e-cancer program on difficult to treat tumors. Uh, we'll be talking today about primary liver cancers as well as kidney cancer and I'm joined on the panel today by Dr. Rene Adam from the hospital Paul Brousse, Dr. Arndt Vogel from Hanover Medical School and Dr. Victor Grunwald from Hanover Medical School. Uh, why don't we start today with a brief introduction of the challenges in hepatobiliary malignancies. So I, I think probably biliary tract malignancies is one of the fields where I think we should, to, we should, we should need to make the, the, the more progress because indeed up to now I would say first resection and transplantation are the only curative option and uh, there is still a lot of uh, progress to be done for optimizing what chemotherapy is able to provide in such type of cancer, meaning I would say uh, hepatocellular carcinoma or B retract cancer, uh, because by extrapolation of what we see in a secondary liver tumor, probably by downsizing such type of uh, tumor, it would be uh, possible to go to a more curative option in these patients. So aren't for patients who can't be resected, can't be downstaged, essentially, you know, Barcelona stage C, advanced liver cancer by stage, what's the landscape like as it stands today? So I think at the moment it's really changing. For a long time we only had local therapies, then sorafenib was introduced and we used it now for, for more than 10 years. And now it's really a time where we have more clinical trials that are reported, not only for systemic therapies, but also the comparison of local therapies to sy the, um, systemic therapies, which I think is really important because we always thought that the systemic, uh, local therapies are better than systemic therapies, but this is obviously not the case. So for Y90, for example, we just learned that um, Y90 is not superior to sorafenib for patients. Um, with more advanced cancer. And I think this gives us a perspective that, that we really need to be more careful when we decide whether we use local therapies or systemic therapies. And when we use local therapies, when is the right time to switch to systemic therapies. Yeah? And in respect to systemic therapies, I think we have now three drugs available, most likely, sorafenib, regorafenib, and lenvatinib. We have a positive trial. And now also we have to decide which drug should we use first. Yeah? And then it comes to the decision, not only the effect on overall survival, but, mainly, but maybe also on, on secondary endpoints. So for example, response rate, what you just mentioned. I mean, so can we use drugs or local therapies for downstaging um, purposes so that we can do indeed resection, maybe also transplantation, and then that we switch patients from a palliative setting maybe to a curative setting. So I think this is really important that we also not only consider overall survival, but also secondary endpoints to, to get different treatment algorithms. And what also is very important is the perspective on the patient, so side effects, quality of life. And here um, we had a presentation on um, quality of life and we saw we compared two TKIs and I think we saw really differences in terms of how the treatment impacts um, uh, on the quality of life of these patients and there were differences and I think we need to learn to understand them and how we really take this into our decision making which drug we use first. So, so you, you presented that data and, and I think you're referring to the results of the REFLEX study, right. which uh, we saw the primary endpoint at ASCO this year. Uh, and you alluded to the fact, after 10 years of serapna being the standard of care in frontline, uh, with multiple negative studies, at ASCO we saw the results of the first positive study in, in advanced liver cancer, which was comparing lenvantinib to serapnib for advanced disease, first line treatment, and it met its endpoint of non-inferiority and uh, non-inferiority showing that uh, lenvantinib gave a survival about 13 and a half months and serafinib I think was about 12.3 months and that was equivalent as far as their effects though secondary endpoints such as time to progression, response rate, PFS was increased with lenvantinib as compared to serafinib. The significance of those we're still trying to find out but an important endpoint you alluded to was 
quality of life. Can you give us a, a brief summary of your data? We used two um, questionnaires in the study. First of all, it was um, very successful. We got the data from more than 98% of the patient, which I, which I think was really remarkable. So the data are very robust and I think um, indicate that we can do these quality of life analyses in clinical trials. And what we saw is that there's an impact um, on the quality of life and global health with both treatments. Um, so there's a decline over time or during treatment. Um, when we look at some of the key domains such as pain, diarrhea, nutrition, body image, we saw a delay um, in clinically meaningful worsening of symptoms in patients that received lenvatinib compared to those that received um, uh, sorafenib. Therefore, I think um, we do see differences yeah, and we need to see how we can integrate this in our so I think uh, that brings us to an important topic in, in liver cancer because especially with a non-inferiority study, uh, we're trying to figure out which subgroups might do better with one drug or the other. Uh, I had presented an interesting biomarker analysis from that study uh, and a hypothesis generating study looking at serum biomarkers. Uh, and we identified a few things that are prognostic actually for both lenvantinib uh, and serafinib. And we also showed how these molecules differently modify the pathways. Uh, and, and while both serafinib and lenvantinib modified VEGF markers, uh, only uh, lenvantinib affect the FGF family. And that might be an important uh, uh, differentiator between the two as we evolve into more data. You also alluded to the fact that the, the only other drug that has positive data is regorafenib in the second line setting, uh, still the only drug that has shown activity in that setting, unlike the first line setting, which we were just discussing. And again, at this meeting, in an attempt to identify who may or may not benefit from uh, uh, regorafenib, which was compared against placebo in the resource study uh, and showed an improvement of survival about three months. Uh, you know, certain proteins were identified in an exploratory analysis that showed some patients might do better than others. Interestingly, again, uh, angiopoietin 1 and angiogenesis marker popped up among other genes as, or other proteins as well. Uh, and it all became relative. It, it, the conclusion from that abstract at the meeting was not that there's any uh, group that did not benefit, but maybe there's degrees of benefit. I think there's a lot of activity going on in this area. Uh, local regional, uh, systemic treatment. But in many ways, kidney cancer is a model for us, right? Uh, and, and we're maybe 10 years behind, right? Because now we have a sequence of two TKIs that looks effective. Now we have two options potentially in the first line setting. Once, presumably, if Linvantinib gets regulatory approval, we'll have two multikinase TKIs in the front line setting. How has the kidney cancer field managed this? And, what was new at ESMO uh, to help clarify the many questions in kidney cancer? It's a wonderful question because I think what, we, what happened during the past 11 years is that we got now in Europe 11 different agents on the wow. market. And uh, so one each year. And I think this, this kind of tells you the story if you have effective treatment on how the landscape may evolve. So you still have a couple of those ahead of you. Um, so, but I think what we have seen at ESMO this year is really um, a game changer. So we have, um, we have entered the field of combinations. I think that started with lenvatinib everolimus a couple of years ago when Bob Mozart presented the data and we have seen first time really impressive um, response data. And um, so since then that really succeeded and nowadays we have um, um, different combinations. So uh, we work on um, combinations, IO, IO combinations. I think this is probably the, the, the biggest message from this year's ESMO, because patients that have been exposed to a CTLA-4 and PD-1 inhibitor really lived longer um, by in, uh, compared to sunitinib, which is the standard TKI in first line. So that, that is, the, for the first time, it happened, really. And it's not only uh, ORR improvement, it's also OS improvement by a hazard ratio of 0.61. So this is really something that is new to the kidney community, because we were lacking evidence of providing OS benefit in first line. So the question would be, is that the end of the story? And uh, I think it's not the case. So uh, we would like to combine TKIs 
Um, so the old stuff with the new stuff with the immunotherapy. And um, that's what's ongoing. And we have seen some phase one, phase two data um, that support the ongoing phase three trials that are already launched and ongoing in RCC. And uh, so um, one, the, one of the combinations has been Vatinib and um, uh, PD-1 inhibition. Right, so last year, I think at ESMO, there was very exciting data about that combination. Today, is, um, it, it, it enlarged in its size. So um, now we have a safe um, dosage for the combination. Um, now we have 30 patients to look at, and um, the overall response rate is 63%. So that's very good, isn't it? Very good. So um, we kind of doubled it compared to sunitinib or regular TKI in first line. Um, so it's one way to look at this is the, is the magnitude of response. Um, the other way is to look into those patients that don't benefit from treatment. And you barely find those in this uh, combination. So usually you have like 20-25% of patients immediate failure to a TKI and here it has been just 5%. So I think this, this kind of tells you how, um, how effective this, this, these kind of combinations can be and that is why we currently uh, pursue phase three clinical studies in, in the first line setting with these kind of combinations. Wow, that's very exciting, a high, that high response rate. And, and I, I think now with lenvantinib showing activity in frontline liver cancer, I know that there's already interest in looking at that combination in HCC as well. Uh, you know, Renee, you hear us talk about in oncology about these, uh, these new combinations, new drugs, Surge surgeons, interventional radiologists, they play a pivotal role in the management of liver cancer. What do you think when you hear this, or do you see a role for integrating some of these into earlier stage? Of course, I, I would give you a, a point of view of a surgeon. And I would say when we are speaking about combination, uh, it's true that in many cancer, combination of drug are optimizing what we are giving to the, to the patient in terms of medical treatment. But there is another combination that we are speaking less on, is the combination of a good chemotherapy with a good surgery. And we have now, I would say, many examples. If I take you an example in biliary tract cancer, the Mayo Clinic, a protocol combining uh, radiochemotherapy, explorative laparotomy, transplantation, have significantly improved from 30% to 70% the five-year survival of those patients. If you take uh, uh, the, the model of the colorectal, uh, colorectal metastatic cancer, it's the same combining uh, drugs with targeted therapy, combining these optimizing treatment with surgery, is able to provide the patient, I would say, a, a significant benefit in survival, if not a possibility of cure in some, of course, very selected patients. So I think uh, the, what my comment of all this is that we should combine all our effort, all the drug, all the different treatment in a way to fight against what is a big enemy, which is cancer in general, yeah. and putting all together, I think, in a very good uh, time sp team spirit, I would say, would optimize the treatment of the patient. And, and these are difficult to treat diseases. I, I mean, I think we just had some adjuvant data with kidney cancer for the first time. Is that correct? I think with sinitinib, was that right? Um, yes, indeed. I mean, uh, there are two, three large studies now nowadays, and two of them are negative and one is positive. So I think we're still in the process of sorting out what's the net benefit for the patient. Um, so it, it is, um, so um, that, that will be a di completely different um, new session that we would open if we start into that discussion. And in regards to biliary tract cancer, again, highlighting the challenges, uh, in our session yesterday, uh, in the oral non-colorectal session, there was a presentation of adjuvant GEMOX uh, after resection for biliary tract cancer. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I think we have now two trials that have been reported this year. One was the Prodigate um, trial from France, and I think that was kind of surprising. They used GAMOX versus ob um, observation. Um, they observed in PFS benefit of 12 months um, 
overall survival benefit of 25 months, but still the data were not significant. Um, and they concluded that statistically they, significant. Statistically, <laughs> that, but yeah, not, maybe not only statistically. I mean, they concluded um, that they would not recommend Germox as adjuvant um, treatment for bilary cancer. But when we look also at the build cup data, and they use just um, 5 fu Xeloda as um, adjuvant therapy, they also observed um, an improvement in PFS and overall survival. Again. The overall survival benefit was not statistically significant. I think it was um, clinically meaningful. So we have now two negative trials, but in both trials we have a survival benefit of 15 to 24 months, which kind of is <laughs> clinically meaningful. And I think we now have to make the decision whether we should, I think we at least need to discuss the data with our patients. And um, personally, I, I would recommend um, adjuvant therapy uh, in, in my patients, maybe not with Gemox, um, but with um, Xeloda. And I think it's very important that we continue with the Actica trial, which compares um, GEMSYS versus now um, Xeloda. And I think we really need this data, which is clear with the statistically negative trials. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for me to see that GEMSYS, GEMOX, I mean, Rest it's all difference. chemotherapy. Right. I think the, the thing that's made a big impact in kidney cancer and and also in, in HCC is probably a better understanding of biology, right? And, and certainly biliary cancer is one where, yeah, yeah, whether clinical subgroups that might benefit better from these interventions or a biomarker subgroup. And, and we're continuing to work and, and try hard and, and there's obviously a lot of work to be done. Uh, any last closing comments, uh, Rene? All these uh, show, uh, in my view, the, 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 the great collaboration that we may uh, do against cancer. I mean, uh, in the past, only medical oncologists were involved in the treatment of cancer. Today, what we are seeing is that uh, molecular biologists are involved, pathologists, medical oncologists, surgeons, radiologists, and I think this is illustrative of the need of a real expert team around all the treatment of a cancer patient in a way to improve the, 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 the result. And I think for me, it's probably the best uh, achievement in the recent years. I think a lot of us in liver cancer, like I said, look at kidney cancer as a, as a paradigm of success or pro, you know, great progress. What would you tell us in the liver cancer field, uh, some advice? And what we have seen in, in renal is that um, um, tumor responses matter. Um, I think it is if you would like to succeed with therapy and just not, you know, you're not aiming to provide a four or six or eight weeks benefit in progression-free survival. I think once you're beyond that point and you really deliver something to the patient that is meaningful, I think this is the best advice I, I can give you because I think then it be away from this discussion. Is it significant, clinically relevant and so on? Right. So because what is important is what really is the net benefit for the patient. and. Um, the prior priority of our patients is they want to stay alive. And yeah. I think that we have to acknowledge that and we have to work on this. And I think Rene did a wonderful example that multidisciplinary teams are necessary. It's not only the drug. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I hope all of you found this uh, interesting, this uh, snapshot discussion from ESMO 2017 on uh, advances and challenges in difficult to treat tumors. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.